Well, um, what an opportunity to be part of the, uh, of the 68th anniversary of establishing this uh, renowned institution. Um, it has come a long way, there's no doubt about that. This one formidable institution that has produced thousands of bankers. I, may, I happen to be a beneficiary, or a benefactor, I mean a beneficiary of this particular opportunity. And then aside from that, taking it from analog side, you have an institution that is highly vibrant, technologically driven, and professional in all in all spheres. And then um, it's one institution that is well poised to take banking or we bankers to another generation, either in terms of corporate governance, professionalism, deal process, as the case may be. And um, they, 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 they've really tried. And aside from that too, this is, uh, they, they are also making another step to onboard the upcoming generation so that there will be continuity. And you know, knowledge is something that is limitless. And when you are talking in terms of banking, as you've not passed through chartered is of bankers. You've not done anything at all. Uh, somebody like me, for instance, I mean, I started a program when I was in school. The rest today is, uh, is history. And every other thing that we learned back then, I'm being put into practice, certainly supported us to be who we are. So if anything at all, the upcoming generation should embrace this institution and take all the ethics seriously. The Masters of Ceremony have done a great job of establishing the protocol list. However, I think it is pertinent that I recognize Your Excellency Senator Kashin Sheti Manjisi O.N., the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, represented by the Special Advisor to the President on National Economic Council and Climate Change Matters. Mrs. Lucrai L. Lufai. Your Excellency, Mr. Babajide Somoulu, the Governor of Lagos, ably represented by Mr. Olu Yomi, who, as we see, is FCIB. Distinguished Senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria here present, of which Senator Abiru, I will, for some of you that may not know, he is also a former Commissioner of Finance in Lagos State. <laughs> Honorable Members of the House of Representatives here present, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wale Edu. And of course, I know you all know, he was also a former Commissioner for Finance in the government. And, and I can't help but wonder why three of them are sitting next to each other. <laughs> Deputy Governors of the Central Bank of Nigeria, The President, Chairman of Council, CIBM, Ken O'Hara. <laughs> Chairman, Body of Bank CEOs, Ebenezer Oyaku. <laughs> and of course, the Chairman, Organizing Committee of the 58th Annual Bankers' Dinner, <laughs> Captains of Industry, 
esteemed audience on the virtual platform, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed truly delighted to be here with you tonight at this esteemed Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria Gala Evening. It is an immense honor to deliver the keynote address on this momentous occasion, the grand finale of the Institute's 60th anniversary. This event holds great significance as it symbolizes the Institute's enduring legacy and the successful transition of leadership from one capable set of individuals to another. I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to the President and Chairman of Council of CIBN, the members of the Dinner Planning Committee and the 60th Anniversary Committee for their exceptional stewardship and leadership. To all members of CIBN, I extend my warmest congratulations on this milestone and I wish every one of you a delightful evening filled with joyous celebrations. Distinguished guests, allow me to take a moment to delve into the rich history of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. The origins of this esteemed institution can be traced back to November 28, 1963, when a group of 124 visionary bankers came together and passed a resolution to establish an institute that would promote banking education in Nigeria and foster a sense of camaraderie among professional bankers. Over the past 60 years, the institute has flourished, leaving behind a legacy of remarkable achievements. Today, the Nigerian banking industry stands as a testament to our homegrown excellence with a lineage of accomplished bankers who have left their inedible mark not only in Nigeria, but all across Africa, Europe, and America. We have witnessed banks initiated by CIBM members grow from humble beginnings into leading institutions that can proudly hold their own on the global stage. Moreover, countless CIBM professionals have risen through the ranks of banking to occupy towering positions of corporate leadership and public service. I recently had the privilege of meeting a young banker who shared her journey of joining the Institute as a fresh graduate, and how the CIBN's commitment to professionalism and ethics shaped her career. She spoke passionately about the transformative power of the Institute programs and how it instilled in her a sense of purpose and dedication to serving her clients and community. Her story reminded me of the human aspect of the banking industry and the importance of organizations like the CIBM in nurturing talent and fostering an environment of integrity and innovation. This annual event is critical as it is an opportunity for us at the Central Bank to interact with major players and the business communities and share our perspectives on the burning issues affecting the banking and financial services sector and the economy in general. Importantly, it avails key industry operators a platform to gain knowledge of regulators' views on the underlying factors driving the state of our economy the policy focus that will shape macroeconomic and financial market conditions, and our understanding of the short 
to medium-term outlook of the economy. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the global economy, much like our domestic economy, often experiences cyclical patterns. The recent Russia-Ukraine conflict, coupled with the ongoing disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, has had severe consequences for global supply chains, particularly in agriculture and energy sectors. These disruptions have resulted in a significant decline in commodity prices and international trade. The sustained high crude oil prices exceeding $80 per barrel have posed challenges for import-dependent countries like Nigeria in managing prices. <clears throat> the prospects of the global economic recovery have been further dampened by the ongoing crisis between Israel and Hamas. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, warns that these conflicts have serious implications for global economic performance and leave little room for policy errors. In response to the inflationary pressures caused by the surge in energy prices resulting from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, monetary authorities worldwide have raised policy interest rates leading to tighter global financial market conditions and significant outflows of funds from emerging market countries. These developments have led to a strengthening of the US dollar, exacerbating inflationary pressures while weakening currencies and depleting external reserves in many emerging market countries. As a result, several central banks in emerging markets and developing economies have implemented restrictive policies to contain rising inflation and reduce capital outflows. The widespread tightening of monetary policy aimed at curbing inflation has restrained economic activity and suppressed growth. According to the IMF, global growth is projected to slow from 3.5% in 2022 to 3% in 2023 and 2.9% in 2024, well below the historical average of 3.8%. Advanced economies are expected to experience a slowdown from 2.6% in 2022 to 1.5% in 2023 and 1.4% in 2024 as the impact of policy tightening takes hold. Meanwhile, emerging markets and developing economies are projected to have a modest decline in growth from 4.1% in 2022 to 4% in both 2023 and 2024. Global inflation is forecasted to steadily decline from 8.7% in 2022 to 6.9% in 2023 and 5.8% in 2024, thanks to tighter monetary policy measures and lower international commodity prices. However, core inflation is expected to decline more gradually and inflation is not anticipated to return to target levels until 2025 in most cases. It is crucial to note that monetary policy actions and frameworks play a vital role in anchoring inflation expectations during these challenging times. In response to these challenges, countries worldwide have adopted various conventional monetary policy measures. Available data 
indicates a gradual recovery in output in the US, UK, and some emerging market economies. GDP growth in the US, UK, and emerging market economies reached 2.2%, 1.4%, and 3.4% respectively in the second quarter of 2023, compared to the same period in 2022. In Africa, on the other hand, countries such as South Africa, Ghana, Egypt, and Kenya saw growth rates of 0.6%, 3.2%, 3.9%, and 5.4% respectively in the second quarter of 2023, thanks to complementary fiscal and monetary policy measures. Considering these developments, it is evident that economic fundamentals play a crucial role in the effectiveness of monetary policy actions in addressing macroeconomic challenges. Therefore, it is imperative that we build a robust institutional framework to support monetary policy in achieving its objectives of ensuring price and monetary stability, which in turn guarantee financial system stability. Considering recent developments within our domestic economy, it is evident that we are facing significant macroeconomic and social challenges. These challenges stem from a variety of factors, including adverse global shocks, unfavorable domestic imbalances, structural rigidities, and the unintended consequences of certain corrective policy measures implemented to restore and realign our macroeconomic landscape. In recent years, the continuous decline in Nigeria's crude oil production has further weakened our already inadequate economic diversification. This has led to a decline in government revenue and foreign exchange inflows while simultaneously witnessing a growth in public expenditure and a deterioration in macroeconomic indicators which has constrained our policy options. Consequently, we have seen the fiscal deficit and public debt increase placing additional strain on external reserves and contributing to exchange rate instability. The GDP growth rate has remained modest declining to 3.1% in 2022 from 3.4% in 2021 and further dropping to 2.5% in the second quarter of 2023. The projection for 2023 stands at 2.9%. Despite this, the non-oil sector continues to be the main driver of growth, expanding by 3.58% in the second quarter of 2023, compared to 2.77% in the first quarter. This growth is attributed to the services, agriculture, and industrial sectors, which contributed 4.2%, 1.94% and 1.50% respectively to overall output growth in the second quarter of 2023. Looking ahead, a growth rate of 2.36% is expected in the third quarter of 2023 with an anticipated increase of 3.9% in the fourth quarter as various reforms take effect. Distinguished guests, 
The domestic factors affecting Nigeria's economic performance span a wide range, encompassing both social and economic aspects. Insecurity remains a pressing issue, affecting the agricultural, industrial, and services sectors simultaneously. The persistently high levels of insecurity have resulted in decreased national output and productivity as many farmers have been unable to access their farmlands, disrupting supply chains and major economic activities. This, not surprisingly, has led to food shortages and inflation in various parts of the country. Infrastructure constraints also pose significant challenges undermining the production chain and distribution network of goods and services. Additionally, issues such as business bottlenecks and a culture of poor service delivery, particularly within the public sector, further hinder the fortunes of the Nigerian economy. Addressing these challenges requires a well-crafted structural policy complemented by coordinated monetary and fiscal policies. Permit me, at this juncture, to further recognize the Honorable Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Olawale Edu, who also emerged from the banking industry and with whom we are collaborating with on these critical issues on a continuous and regular basis. A thorough assessment of the economy reveals significant challenges, including high and rising inflation, inadequate foreign exchange supply, depreciation of the exchange rates, limited external reserves, weakened output, and high unemployment. These challenges have led to increased interest rate, discouraging investment in productive activities. Within the banking system, high inflation has affected asset quality and solvency ratios. Additionally, the persistent depreciation of the Naira poses a significant risk for domestic banks with foreign exchange exposures. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I understand that many of you have concerns about the current state of our economy. And I'm sure when I was reading the whole myriad of problems facing our economy, you must have been saying to yourself, well, we know, but what are you going to do about it? <clears throat> I want to assure you that while it is indeed a formidable challenge, it is not insurmountable. With the right policy measures, we can overcome these obstacles and pave the way for progress and prosperity. I'm confident and optimistic that by taking appropriate corrective actions and strategic steps, we can restore macroeconomic stability and address fundamental flaws. The removal of petrol subsidy and the adoption of a floating exchange rate, among other government policies, are anticipated to have positive effects on the economy in the medium term. These measures are expected to enhance investor confidence 
attract capital inflows, stimulate domestic investment, and ultimately improve the level of external reserves. Additionally, they are expected to contribute to the stabilization of the domestic currency. Indeed, despite the challenging global and domestic macroeconomic environment, Nigeria's financial sector has demonstrated resilience in 2023. with key indications of financial soundness largely meeting regulatory benchmarks. Stress tests conducted on the banking industry also indicates its strength under mild to moderate scenarios of sustained economic and financial stress. Although there is further room, there is room for further strengthening and enhancing resilience to shocks. Therefore, there is still much to be done in fortifying the industry for future challenges, a topic that I will delve into later in my address. In my recent speech at the 370th Bankers Committee meeting, I highlighted the economic agenda of President Bola Ahmed Tunodou's administration. The administration, as outlined in the widely circulated Policy Advisory Council report on the national economy earlier this year, has set an ambitious goal of achieving a GDP of $1 trillion over the next seven years, with clearly defined priority areas and strategies. Attaining this substantial target necessitates sustainable and inclusive economic growth at a significantly higher pace than current levels. The administration, as we know, has already commenced this journey through fiscal reforms. Esteemed guests, considering the policy imperatives and the projected economic growth, it is crucial for us to evaluate the adequacy of our banking industry to serve the envisioned larger economy. It is not just about the stability of the financial system in the present moment, as we have already established that the current assessment shows stability. However, we need to ask ourselves, will Nigerian banks have sufficient capital relative to the financial system's needs in servicing a $1 trillion economy in the near future? In my opinion, the answer is no, unless we take action. Therefore, we must make difficult decisions regarding capital adequacy. As a first step, the central bank will be directing banks to increase their capital. Technology will continue to play a critical role in delivering financial services and enhancing financial inclusion. However, recent developments in the payment services landscape have raised concerns regarding the use of technology and the existing licensing and regulatory framework. We have observed that some licensees are operating outside the approved activities, breaching the boundaries set for them. Any intentional or unintended non-compliance will be subject to sanctions as operators have the responsibility to ensure that they are licensed for the activities they undertake. Concurrently, 
as we conduct a comprehensive review for payment services, we will engage in extensive consultations to develop a new regulatory and compliance framework that is suitable for the technology-driven payment services sector. Looking ahead for the industry, banks should reassess the responsible banking framework to ensure that the requirements are effectively integrated into the strategies. I am aware that some banks have made commendable progress in this regard. Furthermore, the Central Bank of Nigeria is taking steps to enhance its in-house capacity so that it can assist other banks that still have progress to make in implementing their sustainability principles. Distinguished guests, while macroeconomic indicators are valuable in assessing performance, I'm equally concerned about the well-being of the average citizen. The plight of the hard-working masses in our urban centers and villages is a pressing concern. We must ask ourselves, is there a potential future where a brilliant and motivated teenager from anywhere in Nigeria could attend a future anniversary dinner instead of being drawn into outlawed militant groups or extremist ideologies? Likewise, recognizing the pivotal role that women play as critical players in the economy, one cannot overlook the significant impact that providing them with opportunities can have on Nigeria's economic advancement. <laughs> to address this, we need to develop stronger frameworks for measuring the human conditions and ensure that policy makers and business leaders pay as much attention to these measures as they do to macroeconomic indicators. This means tracking indicators such as access to food, shelter, and healthcare as well as education and skills training opportunities. We must also meticulously monitor daily wage rates in lower income jobs. Access to basic amenities like electricity, clean water and sanitation facilities and availability of public transportation. <coughs> From a financial inclusion standpoint, we should track access to financial services, including consumer credit, and ultimately, the ability to finance home ownership on a large scale. By having accurate data on the human condition and implementing appropriate policies based on this data, we can expect inclusive economic growth that leads to tangible improvements in the lives of our citizens. It is crucial to, gain, to give the same visibility to human condition data as we do to macroeconomic data to ensure that the expected economic progress benefits the masses and helps lift them out of their current dire conditions. Distinguished guests, I recently met with a group of small business owners who expressed their concern about the impact of inflation on their operations. They shared stories of struggling to maintain affordable prices for their customers while facing rising costs for raw materials and supplies.
The instability caused by inflation not only affects their profit margins, but also hampers their ability to plan for the future. These entrepreneurs stress the need for price stability to create a conducive business environment that allows them to thrive and contribute to the economy. In recent discussions with individuals from different walks of life, I encountered a young family trying to make ends meet in the face of rising prices. They shared their worries about the erosion of their purchasing power and the challenges of meeting basic needs within a very tight budget. They emphasized the importance of stable prices to protect the well-being of ordinary citizens and ensure a fair distribution of resources. It is crucial that we prioritize price stability to safeguard the livelihoods of our fellow Nigerians. Stabilizing the exchange rate is another critical aspect of our efforts to promote economic stability. I had the privilege of speaking with business owners engaged in international trade. They recounted the difficulties of navigating the fluctuations in the exchange rate, which often led to uncertainties and unexpected costs. The volatility in the foreign exchange market disrupted their planning and hindered their ability to make informed business decisions. It is imperative that we provide transparency and create a market environment that allows fair determination of exchange rates, ensuring stability for businesses and individuals alike. Distinguished guests, to address these challenges, the Central Bank of Nigeria is committed to achieving monetary and price stability. This is not just a technical objective, but it has real life implications for the well-being of all our citizens. Through targeted policies, transparent market operations, and coordination between monetary and fiscal authorities, we can ensure a more stable exchange rate, control inflation, and create an enabling environment for businesses and individuals to thrive. That is what I, together with my team at the Central Bank, have been focused on doing in the past two months. We have critically reviewed the effectiveness of the Central Bank's monetary policy tools and have spent time fixing the transmission mechanism to ensure the decisions of NPC meetings actually result in desired objectives. For quite some time, there has been a dislocation of our monetary transmission mechanisms, rendering the MPC meetings largely ineffective. For the avoidance of doubt, the Central Bank of Nigeria Act 2007 requires that the meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank holds at least four times a year, and the bank has satisfied this requirement for 2023. Applause 
Our focus, therefore, has been on ensuring that these meetings are useful and effective. I'm happy to report that our efforts over the past two months have begun to yield fruit. Regular open market operations, OMO, to mop up excess liquidity from the banking system. An OMO auction was recently held with a stock rate of 17.5% for the one year tenure attracting oversubscription of 350 billion Naira. Another round of OMO has been approved to further reduce excess liquidity. Offering 108.1 billion worth of treasury bills with three tenures to the investing public which can help reduce liquidity in the banking system and support government fundraising. Also, removal of the cap on the Remunerable Standing Deposit Facility, SDF, to increase activity in the SDF window and manage liquidity. Inauguration of a new liquidity management committee within the bank that meets daily at 8 o'clock in the morning to assess liquidity conditions and ensure optimum levels. These measures, distinguished guests, have already started to yield results as excess liquidity in the banking system has significantly reduced and the overnight bank borrowing OBB rate has increased to a level consistent with the monetary policy program. Month to month inflation has already begun to decline with a growth rate of 0.67% in October compared to 0.97% previously. While absolute inflation is still rising, the declining rate of growth indicates progress. The CBN is confident that with continued tightening measures for the next two quarters, they will be able to effectively manage inflation. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, I am aware that events over the past few years have also put the CBN in bad light. These issues can be attributed to various factors such as corporate governance failures, diminished institutional autonomy of the Central Bank of Nigeria, a deviation from the core mandate of the bank, or orthodox use of monetary tools, an inefficient and opaque foreign exchange market that hindered clear access. A foray into fiscal activities under the cover of developmental finance activities. And there was also a lack of clarity in the relationship between fiscal and monetary policies amongst other challenges. Hitherto, the CBN had strayed from its core mandate and was engaged in quasi-fiscal activities that pumped over 10 trillion naira in the economy through almost different initiatives in sectors ranging from agriculture, power, and many others. These clearly distracted the bank 
from achieving its own objectives and took it into areas which it had limited expertise. Distinguished guests, under my leadership, the Central Bank of Nigeria will vigorously address these issues. We will tackle institutional deficiencies, restore corporate governance, strengthen regulations, and implement prudent policies. We assure investors and the business community that our economy will experience significant stability in the short to medium term as we recalibrate our policy toolkits and implement far-reaching measures. Esteemed guests, the primary mandate of the CBM is to ensure price stability in addition to other objectives such as issuing legal tender currency, safeguarding external reserves, promoting a sound financial system, and providing economic and financial advice to the government. In line with our strategy to refocus on our core mandate, the CBN will discontinue direct quasi-fiscal interventionist activities and, <laughs> and instead utilize orthodox monetary policy tools for implementing monetary policy. As part of this refocus, the CBN has just approved the adoption of an explicit inflation targeting framework to enhance the effectiveness of our monetary policy. The details and requirements for this framework are currently being finalized alongst the fiscal authorities. Additionally, the CBN will provide forward guidance, enhance transparency, and maintain effective communication with the public to, to anchor expectations and build trust among stakeholders. Our monetary policies will aim to achieve price stability, foster economic growth, stabilize the exchange rate of the Naira, and reduce interest rates to facilitate borrowing and investing in the real sector. In order to ensure the proper functioning of domestic and foreign currency markets, clear, transparent, and harmonized rules governing market operations are essential. New foreign exchange guidelines and legislation will be developed and extensive consultations will be conducted with banks and FX operators before implementing any new requirements. We have already witnessed improvements in FX market liquidity in recent weeks as the market responded positively to tranche payments 
which have been made to 31 banks to clear the backlog of FX forward obligations. We have been subjecting these payments to detailed verification to ensure only valid transactions are honored. In a properly functioning market, it is reasonable to expect significant foreign exchange liquidity with daily trade potentially exceeding 1 billion US dollars. We envision that with discipline and focused commitment, foreign exchange reserves can be rebuilt to comparable levels with similar economies. Significantly, the envisioned GDP target will put Nigeria in a position of much more favorable macroeconomic indices comparable to other economies of $1 trillion and above, with similar population and development characteristics. As with these countries, there is an expectation that driving to this target requires improvements in productivity, employment, and key macroeconomic growth indices. In drawing a comparison with some of these countries, I had in the address to the, Gampas, to the Bankers Committee audience referred to selected BRICS and MINT economies such as Brazil, Mexico, and Indonesia for their capacity to absorb economic shocks and rebound from cyclical downturn. Significantly, Brazil, with a population of 215 million people, Mexico, with a population of 129 million people, and Indonesia, with a population of 275 million people, which have 2023 unemployment rates at 7.8%, 3.1%, and 5.4%, respectively. These are unemployment levels that we in Nigeria should aspire to achieve and with resolve can attain. <clears throat> Further to the projected growth targets, sectors including agro-processing, oil and gas, manufacturing, solid minerals, fintech, and information technology, real exchange construction, and infrastructure, amongst others, are expected to attract significant capital investments. Having mentioned all these sectors, we must appreciate the soft power projected by the incredibly talented cohorts in the creative industries. Afrobeat, Nollywood, food, fashion, design, and the arts continue to make strong impact in youth employment and contribution to Nigeria's international image. As these sectors expand, so will opportunities for incumbent players and new entrants alike, who are willing to make calculated bets as economic spaces open up from expansion of the economy. Therefore, key macroeconomic indicators, both on fiscal and monetary activities, must be tracked, diligently evaluated, and necessary adjustment made if things are not pointing in the, in the right direction or moving at the right pace. These indicators include GDP growth, tax to GDP, per capita income, balance of payments, 
foreign exchange reserves, unemployment rate, consumer price indices, headline and core inflation rates, as well as more granular measures that we as the regulator use in assessing stability of the financial system. In our assessment of these key ratios, they need to continue to improve. However, we are aware of laudable efforts by the fiscal authorities on this and recognize that visible improvements will take time to manifest. As the monetary authority, we are taking measured and deliberate steps to send the right signals to the market and achieve our mandate. To ensure stability, curb speculation, and restore confidence in the foreign exchange market, we have initiated the payment of unsettled forward foreign exchange obligations and these payments will continue until obligations are cleared. The CBN has also lifted the ban on 43 items from accessing the official foreign exchange market, allowing market forces to determine exchange rates. We are witnessing clear progress in stabilizing the Nigerian foreign exchange market. Distinguished guests, please allow me to provide further clarification on the issue of the 43 items. Firstly, it is important to note that these items were never outrightly banned by the government. The CBN had imposed restrictions on their access to foreign exchange in the official market. However, these restrictions resulted in increased demand for foreign exchange in the parallel market, leading to the depreciation of the exchange rate in that segment of the Nigerian foreign exchange market and widening the premium between the parallel and official market. Studies have in fact shown that during the period when the 43 items were restricted, there's a 51% increase in trade evasion by importers accessing the foreign exchange market, resulting in a revenue drop of, ex of approximately $1.4 billion annually between 2015 and 2019. Resulting in a revenue drop of, ex of approximately $1.4 billion or 275 million annually between 2015 and 2019. Additionally, revenue from tariffs on goods decreased from a high of approximately $920 million in 2011 to about $250 million in 2017. In 2019, the actual tariff on goods stood at $320 million, but counterfactual evidence suggests that as much as $618 million could have been earned in that same year. I'm actually a PR consultant, so I'm not a banker, if that's what you were hoping to hear. I'm just here because my dad, a past banker and a past president of the institute, is being honored, Dr. Femi Az Adekoye. There he is. <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm just in a celebratory mode, as you can tell, because my dad was a proud banker. 
I worked as a banker very briefly in my early life. So I just want to interact, have some fun, celebrate the old man. He's long gone, but I mean, while he was here, he was very proud of this profession. So it's a very good honor to be part of this celebration. <laughs> I'm the chairman of uh, Brent Mortgage Bank and former registrar of the Chartered Institute Bankers of Nigeria. To God be the glory, it's an institution that has uh, really made banking education uh, very unique and uh, professionalism, ethics in the banking sector has been the real uh, mandate of the institute. The institute has actually contributed for 
um, 60 years ensuring that the stability of the banking industry is uh, something we can be very proud of. It's made the uh, banking profession uh, a noble one, as is, we normally refer to. And of course, shaping the economy uh, through its advocacy, its research, and of course, making Nigeria proud, even taking the banking education, uh, professional banking education across Africa, and of course, uh, to international level, despite the fact that he came from uh, the international arena to Nigeria, has returned that back to London, to Canada, to US, and we are very proud of the institute. He's done a great job, he's done a great um, uh, impact on so many bankers in this country. We sure hope you enjoyed this video. For more entertaining video content such as behind the scenes of music videos and movies, music concerts, premieres, interviews and exclusive gists, subscribe now to our YouTube channel Goldmine TV and be unleashed into a world of super excitement.